The gospel setting is in Cana of Galilee. And I know that many of you who have journeyed as pilgrims have visited Cana. It's about 70 miles north of Jerusalem in the area of Galilee. It has a population of about 20,000, maybe about the size of South Pasadena, a little bit smaller. And there is a very significant Christian community even today in Cana. It appears only in the Gospel of John. Three times Cana is mentioned in John's Gospel. We have the wedding feast, and then in chapter 4, there is a cure. The centurion, or royal official's son, is sick, and Jesus cures him. That happens. He does that at Cana. And there's one other small reference in chapter, nine, no, chapter 21 in John's Gospel where it makes a reference to Nathaniel. It says, Nathaniel is from Cana in Galilee. Now, outside of these three references, it doesn't appear, and it's not mentioned in the other Gospels. So it's exclusive to John. There's a very nice little parish church there in Cana, and uh, we visited there many times with pilgrims. And when we go there, uh, we have a wedding feast. I have the, the pilgrims come, and we go in the chapel and uh, have the couples renew their vows, and then one or two couples give testimonies about their journey and their marriage and various things about their marriage. And uh, then we have a wedding feast. We go to the vendors are very happy to get you in their shop. They'll give you a cane of wine. It's cheap wine. It's, it's not very good wine, but it's, it's cane of wine. And, but they're happy to get you in. They'll give you a cane of wine, because then you'll buy their goods. So uh, we go to one of the vendors there, known to us a, a Christian, and uh, he has a little cake. I get flowers for the brides, and uh, it's wonderful. Cana is a very enchanting place. Um, one year, in one of our pilgrimages some years ago, we got to Cana, to the church there, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and the church was closed. And we decided that, I decided, I guess, that there's a little patio, an enclosed patio in front of the church doors, and we'd have our ceremony there. And I decided we'd dedicate our prayer and our ceremony for all couples excluded from the church in their marriages, since the church doors were closed. Why don't we dedicate this renewal of vows to all the couples not married in the church, since somehow the church was closed? And the testimonies were uh, marvelous. They were very touching. Everybody in the group somehow had somebody who was excluded from the church in a very holy and blessed marriage. It made us wonder about what makes a marriage holy? Do I make the marriage holy because I presided it? How do, you, how do you see sacrament and holiness in a marriage? Um, in 1563, almost the last document of the Council of Trent, it's, it's written in November 11th because it's very defining and easy to remember, it was called Temesti which is the first word of the document. It doesn't have any great significance for the substance of the document. It had to do with a number of things, but especially with marriage and regulations about marriage and what's necessary and all the things that are required for sacramental presence in marriage. Before that, it was very confusing. Various disciplines and various uh, liturgies of marriage uh, were very commonplace, and this collected uh, all of these various traditions into one and said, this is the way it must be. And anybody who objects to this, let them be anathema, which means you're out. Um, it's very, and it spawned a huge body of legal uh, requirements uh, to somehow have the church accept a marriage as sacramental and as valid. Now, of course, with the 
synod that came up um, recently in Rome, there's a whole discussion about marriage and what's, how is a marriage holy and how we should include people in the community of faith, even though they may not uh, meet all the requirements of Temesti and its subsequent upgrading. It also prompts us to face a reality which is same-sex marriage, which is, is commonplace now and is socially uh, acceptable, and somehow how the church is going to relate to this. We have persons in this community who are involved in same-sex marriage, and the question is, is there a place in our hearts for these people? Do they belong to us or don't they belong to us? Is there a place in the community of faith for them? And how do we somehow include them in a community of prayer and a community of where, which is Christ-centered? Now, before you answer the question, let me look at the teaching of the sign at Cana in Galilee. As you know, in the Gospel of John, he, does ne he never mentions miracles. He has seven signs. And they said, this is the first of the signs that Jesus does. And uh, the second will also be at Cana in chapter 4. And then we have signs like he'll calm the waters and feed the multitude and cure the blind man. And the last sign is in chapter 11 where he will raise Lazarus from the dead He's been dead for four days. He's not just dead, he's very dead. I mean, he's been dead for four days. Uh, putrefaction has set in, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. Chapter 11, the greatest sign, appears only in John's Gospel. So it's a sign. Now, when we look at the details of this narrative about Cana, Jesus speaks to his mother, and he, she says they have no wine which gives us the impression that she had some stake in the moment. Um, the wedding in the time of Jesus went on for seven days. So there's a lot of drinking going on there. <laughs> for seven days. So she said they have no wine. Um, some commentators think maybe she belonged to the family of the bridegroom, but however, that's not mentioned. But she does have an interest in this, obviously. And he says, woman, what concern is this of mine, you know? What, why does you, your concern, what, what does it have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. The reference to woman is interesting because it, in our culture today, it might sound pejorative, but that wasn't true then. It was a very respectful and reverential re way of referring to his mother at the time. It appears in one more place, and that is uh, in chapter 19. You'll remember this, that when Jesus is dying on the cross and he looks down and the beloved disciple is there with his mother and he says, woman, behold your son. It's the only other reference. The Gospel of John never calls the mother of Jesus Mary. It refers to her as the mother of Jesus only. It doesn't name her. So Jesus' reference is very respectful even though it may not fit our temperament and our language today. And then he says, he says, do whatever he tells you. There are six stone water jars, each 20 to 30 gallons. He changes the water into wine. That's a lot of wine, 120, 150 gallons of wine, lot, lots of. Don't get caught in that. It's just a sign. And the sign is when God performs something in response to our needs, it's always lavish. It's much more than we expected. The sign says, when Jesus performed this miraculous uh, exercise here, it's meant to say God's love is lavish. God's love is abundant. It's inclusive. It's unmerited. There's no reference that the couple deserve this. It's no reference. They even asked for this. It was a free gift, and it was in such abundance. It's a statement of the abundance of God's love. 
We don't care whether it's 120 or 150 gallons. It's a sign of the abundance of God's love. And therefore, before we answer any questions about who's included and who deserves and who has merited, look at the signs of God's abundant love, the inclusive, the embrace of God's love, the blessing of God's love. We'll only understand that, my friend, when we have our own crisis. Until we have our own crisis, there's a danger we'll become self-righteous. There's a danger that we become judgmental, that we'll think we're better than other people. We don't need the abundance of God's love. When we are in sin, when you're in darkness and you fail and you're hopeless, then you pray that you will experience the abundance of God's love, for that's all which will somehow respond to you. A small measure won't do. You'll need something great. You'll need something lavish, extraordinary. You'll need something supreme to somehow encourage you to start believing that God's love belongs to you in your crisis, in your darkness. When everyone else excludes you, God embraces you. That's the teach. That's the sign. And by the way, you'll find this if you look through, read through John's Gospel and, and look at the depth of the signs in John's Gospel. This will be repeated over and over again. Go to chapter 4 for the second sign. It's uh, the royal official whose son is very ill and Jesus cures him. He's not a Jew. He doesn't belong to the tradition. He's not a follower of Jesus. He has no reason to deserve this, but Jesus gives him the gift. In chapter 5, there's a man who has been sick for 38 years in the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. He doesn't deserve anything. Jesus heals him. He feeds the multitude. The multitude had to include sinners. They couldn't be all perfect. They weren't all in the state of grace. There were all sorts of weird, crazy people in the multitude. He fed them. He calmed the waters. He cured the blind man. Chapter 9 and then chapter 11, he raised Lazarus. There's nothing to say Lazarus deserved it. Wow. So before you answer any question about who belongs and who doesn't belong, you must read the depth of the signs in the Gospel of John, and it's prompted by our reading today. There is a, a book just came out this week, and, and wonderful and at the bookstore got it for me, first off the press, called The Name of God is Mercy by Pope Francis. Beautiful reflection on the dominant presence of the living God is mercy. It's a very simple because Pope Francis speaks in language that we all understand. He understands me. I mean, he speaks language that I can read and understand. And again, it touches on the theme coming out of this gospel. The name of God is mercy. And the name of the sign is infinite love. Amen.